We're continuing our series this morning entitled Political Commercials. And you know if you watch political commercials that you're, what you're oftentimes hearing and seeing are a bunch of half-truths and, and, and about whoever it is about. And that's kind of the, the birth of the idea. I have finally discovered that my YouTube, uh, like I don't know what you call it, but like where it's trying to advertise to me directly, I had that turned off. And so I, I'm going to turn that back on. So I think if I turn, I don't, if they're advertising to me directly, it probably will not be political commercials anymore. So then maybe I can end the series if I can stop watching political commercials. But you also know if you've already been here, and I think all of you have in the last couple of weeks, that the, these aren't really a political hot button uh, attacking sermons. Uh, and today we're going to uh, be looking at the phrase, God helps those who help themselves. And it's not the first time, I think this is the second, maybe the third time that I thought like I would... You know, preach a sermon, I knew there would be some small percentage of people who, who really kind of back that statement, believe in it. But then when I started looking into it, uh, it was overwhelming, and especially one of the studies was done in 2001. I was 21 years old, and so they might have actually asked, you know, my peer group, and it was something like 75% of younger people, actually I think it might have said teenagers, so I wouldn't have quite qualified, but I would have been a little bit closer to that age. 75% of te Christian teenagers believe God helps those who help themselves uh, as, a, as a statement, but also uh, believe it in the Bible. And some people, there were percentages, both, all percentages over 50% uh, where people believed either the statement was true itself or they also believed it was in the Bible. Usually when you would say you believe that's in the Bible, the percentage would drop slightly, but still it was a percentage that was over 50% of Christians. And so I found that interesting this week. And that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to begin this morning in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 and 3. We'll have this verse for you on the screen. Paul, the apostle, is writing here, and he says, So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what was impossible for the law, since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his own son to deal with sin, so in the same body as humans who are controlled by sin. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your Apostle Paul for his faithfulness to you and his dedication. And God, we thank you for the, the transformation that you did in his life and, and for the ways that you used him to, to bless so many. And even his words today are speaking to us. Lord, we ask that you would bless the hearing of the word, the reading of the word that we've heard today, that you would bless the words of my mouth as I proclaim this message today. And I pray that you would unite all of our hearts together and everything we do here would be pleasing your sight. Christ, you are our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. As you, I think about this statement, God helps those who help themselves, one of the first things that came to my mind was money doesn't fall from, from the sky, or it doesn't grow on trees. Now, there are these things. Have you, anyone of you ever received a money tree? A money tree is amazing. I, I received a money tree when I left my church in, in Georgia as youth pastor to move here. When Marie and I got married, I received a money tree. People actually attach money to the tree, and it's a great thing that people give to you uh, that has lots of money on a tree. But you can't actually, obviously, right, we all know you can't plant a tree that grows us money. And we look at this phrase, God helps the, those who help themselves, I also know that our human condition is sometimes we don't even like to accept things like that because we want to be strong and independent and we want to be known as hard workers. But we have to ask ourselves the question, is this phrase, God helps those who helps themselves, is it a biblical statement? And, and is there something, you know, maybe sometimes we even teach and believe things that aren't necessarily in the Bible, but is it a truth even that arises from the Bible? We're going to look at that here today. Now I have advised people when they have come to me and they've asked for help uh, and, and not just, I'm not talking about panhandlers. I don't usually uh, get into deep uh, job, you know, like you know, I don't tell a panhandler you need to get a job or, you know, talk to them very much, but uh, in depth and what they need to do. But if somebody comes to me, it's in my office or, you know, in someone in the church and they start talking about needing help, I want to help them. 
And I even started telling people, like, I'm going to help you today, but I want to help you beyond today, too. I would say I would, that was more of a, a phrase that I'll say maybe the second or the third time someone comes. The first time usually is just let me try to meet the need. The second and the third time, it's like, well, how can I really help you so that this doesn't happen again? And so we'll start working with people. Uh, and I'll say, you know, like, you know, you could, uh, you're not going to be able to just stay home and pray and expect good things to happen for you. And usually this is actually oftentimes when people sometimes in my family, and it's actually more frustrating when it comes when it's your family, when, when they tell you they're needing something and you say, like, what are you doing about it? And they say, I've been praying for a job. And I say, oh, did you apply for a job? Well, no, I've been praying for one. And I was like, oh, well, and then, well I'm praying for the right job. And I said, they'll need some money. And I will say, well, have you done anything to, to get some money? Or have you even asked anybody for, for money? And they said, no, I've been praying for it. And I was like, how does that work? Like, how many of you like, are really going to get, remember Ed McMahon shows up on the door with a check? I think you might even had to fill something out to get Ed McMahon to show up. You know, the point to all this, God doesn't just drop food on our table. He doesn't give us jobs that we never applied for. He doesn't find relationships or repair relationships while we sit at home praying about it. Uh, you know, I worked with younger people, and I guess most of ministry I've worked with younger people in some regard. And, and how many times they'd say, like, I just can't wait to meet that, that lady of my dreams or that man of my dreams. And I'll say, like, well, where do you go to meet these people? Well, I'm not meeting anybody. I'm just praying about it. Uh, you know, God's going to send me somebody at the right time. And I think you're probably not going to get the person you're looking for sitting at home. I mean, that would even be kind of weird if, if that happened, most likely. God has blessed us with brains and wisdom and strength, and he's given to us gifts. And he's oftentimes he puts people in our lives who have knowledge that we don't have, or they have, they have wisdom that we don't have, that are able to help, to lead, and to guide us in ways that, that and do things that we are trying to attempt to do. Uh, that we might not be able to do on our own. But God has also given us abilities to, to do things on our own. And so there's this comes this idea that Paul addresses a little bit, this concept. And, and in 2 Thessalonians is a verse that's often used when you use the phrase, God helps those who help themselves. 2 Thessalonians is the phrase that's oftentimes used. Uh, and, and it goes like this. Even when we were with you, Paul writes, we were giving you this command. If anyone doesn't want to work, they shouldn't eat. This is a verse that people oftentimes use uh, when they are kind of supporting God helps those who help themselves. Now, Paul is writing this phrase and, uh, to a group of new Christians. And you see Paul on his second missionary journey, he started a new church. And in that second missionary journey, he started a new church doing a, what he was supposed to be doing as a preacher and as an evangelist. He taught those people that they needed to place their whole trust and their faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone and probably taught them that they were trusting and believing in some things that they were not supposed to be trusting in or believing in. And I would imagine because of the time, and even to this day we teach this kind of, we teach this, is that, that they need to also be waiting and expecting Jesus to return. Even to this day, we're waiting and expecting Jesus to turn. I, I had a phone conversation. It's kind of a, a fun phone conversation I had uh, with someone from one of our churches uh, between here and Highland the other day. And 10 minutes into the conversation, the most delightful conversation that you could possibly have with somebody for 10 minutes, and she said, and where are you located? And I realized at that point she had no clue that she was talking to me the entire time. I did introduce myself when I called, but I was just thinking about how nice are the people here in Birchville that she would talk to me that long about all that we talked about and not even know who it was she was talking to. Well, when I got her on the right, you know, on the right track and she knew she was talking to me, uh, she began to ask me this question, you know, like, uh, do you think that Jesus is coming back? Is COVID kind of a sign that Jesus is coming back? And and, and, I, and I said what I probably said, you know, dozens of times throughout ministry when different events have happened just over the last 10 years of my ministry and knowing kind of history and saying, you know, for the last hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, things have happened. We expect Jesus to come back, but it could happen in a minute or an hour or it could be another 2000 years. I don't know if COVID is like that sign that says, like, you know, this is it. But what I do know is we have to live and place our trust in Jesus and live for Jesus all that we can all the time. And when Jesus comes back, we have to be ready for that. It's kind of how the, the tone of the conversation went. Well, Paul was having this conversation with uh, his converts. He had taught them 
their need to trust Jesus. He taught them about waiting for Jesus to return. And some of the people had taken that to mean that they could quit work or they could spend money however they wanted to spend money or, or you know, maybe for them money wasn't quite what they were spending. But, you know, that could easily happen to us today, kind of in the midst of COVID. I, we could actually get in our minds, you know, we could just go out and just run up all of our credit cards, max them out all the way. Why not? Because we're not going to ever have to pay for it anyway. But Paul tries to warn against that. And he certainly tries to warn against quitting your job and just staying home all the time. And even sometimes we could have people that maybe I could just quit this job and be more holy and I could stay home and pray all the time. And Paul even seems to kind of strike at the base of that by saying, if you don't want to work, you don't get to eat. And of course, I, I think if we dug deeper into this, and I feel like we've talked about this before in a sermon, this applies to those who can work. And again, it was not where I'm wanting to go fully with this today to discuss all the ins and outs of that. But if you don't work, you don't eat. It, of course, applies to those who could work. It doesn't apply to people who were disabled for any reason. And Paul kind of is bringing out this, this tone in, in Paul's way of living and, and that I've tried to adopt in my life. And, and the Benedictine monks have, have worked on this. They have what they call the rule of life, and they have a statement, ora et labore, and I love that statement. It's been one of those that I've heard and I picked up and, and I like the sound of it. It reminds me of a way of life that I want to live. Or at the war, it means pray and work. And, and I like that concept of when you're praying, while you're praying, you're also working. While you're praying, you're also being active. You know, Paul doesn't teach and scripture doesn't teach that we could pray and sit on our hands and sit home and do nothing. But rather, it's different. It's, it's pray and also be working towards those things that we're praying for. It's our faith in Jesus and our faith in, in God. It's supposed to move us to action. When you think about all the people in Scripture and how they prayed and how they worked and how they combined those two things together, Abraham had to sacrifice. Jacob had to go. Moses had to obey. Joshua had to march. Jonah had to repent. Nehemiah had to rebuild. Peter had to follow. And Paul had to proclaim. All of these are actions. And our faith is supposed to be live and active. It's supposed to be living. It's supposed to be something that moves us forward in the direction that God is leading us. Waiting on the Lord. There are probably times, there are certainly times, where we wait on the Lord. But that doesn't mean even in our waiting that we are completely actionless. Do you know sometimes in my own life, and I think even more so lately, but I've also I've seen it throughout the, my time as a pastor of church, there are just people, and again, myself included in that at times, where it's just like we're waiting for this like golden engraved invitation to arrive on our doorstep from God that says this is exactly what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. And, 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 and I've even talked to people, and again, I've been that way sometimes in myself in my own mind, and I thought if I just had all the clarity, all the vision that I needed in this very moment, I would, I would move, I would take action, I would do something. But because I don't know what I'm doing, because I can't see the full plan, because God himself hasn't come down and shined a bright light in my face like he did for Paul in Damascus Road, because that hasn't happened, because I don't have enough information, information. I haven't received that engraved invitation. I'm going to sit back and do nothing. But we're supposed to pray and we work. We pray and we work. And I have found more often through experience that we discover God's calling when we are active, when we choose to serve. And God even said it himself, when we seek him. Even what God tells us to do when he says you have to seek first the kingdom of God is an action. And sometimes when we're trying to pray and discern something, surely there's times of waiting and, and moments of waiting, but there should be more moments of action, even if the action is seeking after God's will and purpose in that moment. And we usually discover while we're being active and moving what God is intending for us to do. And in those moments, God uses us to be instruments for God that changes the world. When that itself is a great opportunity to be a part of God's great world-changing activities. But is the statement, God helps those who help themselves, true? Well, I think if it is, it becomes, we become our primary source of strength. If we believe and if we practice, 
God helps those who help themselves. We've made God secondary and we've become the primary. I know I've talked to you before about disordered love, St. Augustine's disordered love. I read a little bit more about that this week. And St. Augustine, actually, he goes ahead and he orders the loves for us. He says that you love God, you love others, and you love yourself. That that's the correct order. If you get any of those out of place, you have and you found what this is disordered love. You see, the problem, St. Augustine says, comes when you love something you should love because you should love God, obviously. You should love others. You should love yourself. But when you get any of those three things out of order, you have disordered love. And he said the problem comes when you love something that you should love, but that you should not love supremely. When you've put something in a, in a higher place, a higher value assessed on it than you ought to. John Calvin, the great theologian, said the human heart is an idol factory. Just think about all the things that we idolize in our, in our culture, in our community. All the things that we just, even over the last six months that we've said, you know, I just don't think I could live without that. If those people, you know, if those UK football players don't come back and play football, I don't know if I'm ever going to even wake up on Saturdays ever again. The human heart is an idol factory. Pastor Tim Keller, he asked the question, kind of helping us to narrow down and focus in on what our idols are. And this first question he asked is really hard to, to even kind of flesh out what he means and, and what that might look like for me and I think for us. But he says, what thing, if you lost it, would almost mean that you would lose the will to live? And what thing lost or gone from your life would mean that almost all value and significance, identity and worth, would be drained from your life. Is there anything like that that swirls around in your life? Is it a job? Is it a position, a role maybe that you have? Is it something that you have? What thing lost or gone from your life would mean that almost all value and significance, identity and worth would be drained out of your life? Timothy Keller says, whatever that thing is, the Bible calls an idol. When we believe that God helps those who help themselves, we've made God secondary. And I'm here to assure you that God doesn't teach that. And scripture doesn't teach that. Scripture doesn't teach God helps those who help themselves. In fact, in our scripture we read this morning, we learned the opposite is true. God helps those who can't help themselves. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans 8, 1 and 3, we read this morning, verse 3 says, God has done what was impossible for the law. Now there was this law, and you would think, and the way the Pharisees and the Sadducees lived, they lived as if this was something that was supposed to be obtainable, something they could do. Their works is what made them good. This is what made them proven before God. And Paul says that this law was insufficient. And he says it was insufficient because of the selfishness. But because the law couldn't do it, God did it for us through his son, Jesus Christ. That's grace and that's salvation. What we couldn't do for ourselves, God did. And through Jesus Christ, God helped those who couldn't help themselves. And he calls us as his followers to do the exact same thing. Do you know some people can't help themselves? at least not easily. I mean, there really are times and situations where people aren't able to do all for themselves that, that they would like to. And, and maybe you've kind of found yourself in that same position in life at some point in time. I know I found myself there more lately than I would even like to admit. But I also kind of, I wrestled with this concept a little bit this past week. And, and then the last, I think it was earlier this week or two weeks ago that I read a an article about how cynicism, and this is one of the kind of the growings I've tried to do over the last like six months, cynicism can eat away your leadership. Cynicism can eat away your relationship. Cynicism can eat away so much. And, and I started reflecting on how, how, how cynical in many ways that I had become, you know, personally. And I started reflecting on even early on in my ministry how, how idealistic I used to be, and I, and I really think there, I mean, there's, 
I, I used to actually get criticism for being idealistic, and I always felt like it was one of my greatest strengths of ministry is that I didn't know what I didn't know, and I believed that I could do anything because I'd never experienced not being able to do anything. And so it becomes this great strength, and I saw it when I worked with college students, and I've seen it when I've worked with youth, that they believe that literally anything they want to do, they can do it. They don't know any different. So there's this great strength to that. And you all probably know there's some wisdom, too, of knowing what you, kind of learning and growing and figuring out things that you can and can't do, and it, all this time, it saves you energy. It saves you time. But pre any kind of cynicism kind of gained from ministry and being a younger idealistic pastor, I always, I mean, I was going to do anything I could to help anybody that came and said they needed help. And I can remember this one uh, couple that came to me and said that they needed help. And, and, and one of the things that I did quite often, because I would tell people, uh, I, I'm going to help you today, but I also want to help you long term. And I don't know what that would look like for you, but maybe it begins with budgeting. And so I would help people with budgeting, and we would sit down, and if they would let me. And, and honestly, most people didn't go for that. That wasn't really, I don't know what the statistic would be. We'll say one in three took me up on it. It wasn't something most people got excited about. And, and, I, and I knew with this couple there wasn't going to be a lot of money available. But when we actually got down and started looking at the real numbers, they had less than not a lot. And so I then turned to, well, maybe you need another job. I mean, everybody could, you know, you probably could work two jobs. Uh, you could fit that into your day. Might could fit in three jobs. I've known people that have had three jobs, and you could probably fit all that in. I did some math uh, yesterday, and I didn't write it down. I probably should have, but the minimum wage in the state of Kentucky now is $7.25. I think it's been that for a while. But if you work 40 hours a week at $7.25, you're going to make around $15,000 a year. And so if you had two of those jobs, you know, that you could, you're going to get $30,000 a year if you're working 80 hours a week. And so like I said, it ends up not being a lot of money. And so just kind of realizing the circumstance that these people were in and having just the one job, I turned to like, well, what's your education and your experience? And I remember the guy said, I dropped out of middle school. And I said, well, okay. I'm kind of getting a little bit daunted here. And I'm thinking, well, do you have any like references? You know, it really matters sometimes the people, you know, like if you know somebody that can kind of hook you up with a job, I know that could be. And he said, sir, if I had references, if I knew somebody to give me a job, I wouldn't be here asking you for help. And I said, well, let's look in, I'll let you look in the paper and I'll search the internet. And after about an hour of searching, you know what I found out is there wasn't not only a job for that person, there was no jobs in there uh, available for me to apply for either. There are some people sometimes, and we could tend to look down on them and, you know, you could question and say, well, if he wouldn't have dropped out of middle school, if he wouldn't have done this, if he would have done this instead, there's a lot of like woulda, shoulda, coulda. But in that moment, the only thing you can do to help somebody is kind of in where they are then in that moment. You can't run them back through time. You got to do what you can do with kind of what you have. And sometimes I think we too quickly look down upon people who are facing challenges that they themselves in that moment can't overcome. I mean, have any of you ever been there? And maybe it's not with a job, and that's not with money, but there's just some circumstance that you've found in your life where you can't overcome it on your own. You don't have all the knowledge that you need to have. You don't have all the resources you need to have. You just know that there's an obstacle in your way, and you can't overcome it. I probably even have told you all the story about coming to Kentucky, and, and I don't know which parts I told you and which parts I didn't, but it kind of struck me this past week. And the part about coming to Kentucky and, and eating rice and beans and peanut butter for, for several weeks, if not a couple of months, is, is, is very true. I went out looking for jobs, just like that's what I thought. You know, you need a job. You got to go out looking for one. I got hired on the second job that I went to. I ended up working more than I wanted to. Uh, and, and starting seminary at the same time. I was working 40 hours a week and doing seminary. And so I tell this story, and I think this kind of goes back to that human condition, which I actually stumbled through at the very beginning. And, but this idea that we want to be self-sufficient, and we like to think that we did it all by ourselves. And so with no malice intent, I oftentimes, when I tell my story about coming to Kentucky and how difficult it was in those early days, I oftentimes forget that the church where I was youth pastoring down in Georgia paid for my apartment for the first three months. I wouldn't have made it, or not three months, three years. I wouldn't have made it a day 
if it wasn't for that church, if it wasn't for those people. And we oftentimes forget kind of the journey along the way of the people that helped us, whether it was our parents. I've had friends whose parents saved for college. I had a friend whose dad helped pay for the down payment on his first house. Isn't that nice? There's been people in people's lives that have been able to kind of assist them and help them and churches that have helped us out. Sometimes, you know, we've had to reach out. People have had to reach out and receive government assistance to get help. But all along the way, at some point in time in our lives, and it's not always monetary. In fact, I don't know if it usually is monetary for most of us, but there's been some point in time in our life where someone has helped give us a hand up. God helps those who can't help themselves. And that's what he calls us as his followers to do the same. There's this wonderful story in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is going on his way back to Capernaum and people heard that he was at a home. And there's these five guys, it's like these four buddies and their one friend who was paralyzed. And the four guys heard Jesus was coming into town and, and they found very quickly that they were not alone and wanting to get in to see Jesus. And those four buddies were willing to do anything they could to get their fifth friend in and, and meet Jesus. But there were literally crowds and crowds of people just like anywhere that Jesus went. And this is what I find so interesting. Everywhere that Jesus went, there were crowds pushing in to get to him. There were people who were reaching out that their only hope was if they could if they could reach out and touch the hem of his garment, that they might would be healed. There were people who thought, if I could just get in, if I could know that I could see Jesus' face and he could see my face, that my life would be transformed forever. And these four friends wanted their friend to have that experience so bad that they took out their knives and, and they saw all these crowds and they began digging through the mud and the thatch on the roof so that they could lower their friend down on the stretcher so that he could meet and see Jesus in hopes that he might could be healed, in hopes that he might be able to walk again. And that's exactly what happened. And when I was reading this story again last night and, and I was just kind of reading it out loud to myself and something struck me that I didn't even expect to strike me. It, and I asked myself, what is it about me? And what is it about the church? And what is it about Christians that people aren't breaking out their knives to dig through the roof? so that they can come here, so that they can come into any church. It's not just First United Methodist Church in Burksville or Highland Chapel United Methodist Church in Burksville. I'm talking about any church. We as Christians, as followers of Jesus, are the physical manifestation of Jesus Christ on earth. We are the ones that the Holy Spirit chose to dwell inside. Why aren't people doing everything that they can to get to us? What am I not doing? How am I not being Jesus enough that people want to come and people want to get near to us, near to me? God moves us to action. And God calls us, every single one of us, to have stretcher bearers. That's what these four friends have been come to be known as. Stretcher bearers. God calls people into our lives. He brings people into our lives who, who carry us and help us to meet Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. God also puts us in people's lives so that we can be their stretcher bearers so that we can carry them to meet Jesus. You know, there are times when someone has helped us along our journey, that someone has helped introduce us to Jesus, someone has told us about Jesus, they've talked to us about Jesus, and, 
And I believe if we're living out our mission and our calling as followers of Jesus, there's going to be times when we are doing the same. There should be people that we are carrying on proverbial stretchers so that they can come face to face with the Jesus that we know, that we proclaim, that we experience his love and his mercy and his grace on a daily and sometimes moment to moment basis. There are times when we become the hands of God, that we become the answer to someone else's prayers, when God uses us to be instruments of peace in someone's life. And then there are times when we don't have any answers. We don't have any quick fixes. We don't know what to do. And we ourselves, we, we feel like we have no power, that we are lacking strength, we're lacking resources, and we're lacking knowledge. And one of the things that I find a lot is people don't feel like they deserve help. Some of the most like godly people, some of the most loving and gifted and graceful, grace-filled people that I've ever met that would bend over backwards to help someone else out. They would, they would be the ones who are, who are going and grabbing the stretcher and digging through the roof so that their friend could come and meet Jesus. Those people themselves don't feel like they deserve any help. And all they know to do in those moments and all we know to do in those moments sometimes is we cry out to God and we find ourselves in despite of being poor and pitiful and weak and afraid that we've made a mess of things. That we've taken a situation and completely messed it up. And God in those times, he reaches out to us and he picks us up and he makes us clean. And he sends us into other people's lives to be a messenger for him. To remind them that God says to them, it's just as he says to us, that God says, I love you and I will not abandon you. Put your trust in me and together we're going to get through this. We're going to make it right. God, over and over again, this is the message we hear from him. This is the message we read in scripture where God is saying to us, I'm here. You matter. Your life has meaning and nothing you've done, nothing you haven't done can separate you from the love of God. And that's what we call grace. And most often when we are in that time of our greatest need and our darkest hours, we find that God sends someone to be our stretcher bearers, to be the answer to our prayers, to be God's instrument of peace. It's just how the kingdom works. Because when we pray, we work. When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, then we work to make sure that it happens. That's how the kingdom of God is designed. We pray and we work. We pray and we work. We're stretcher bearers for other people when they are in their lowest of lows. And we trust and place our faith in God that he's going to send us stretcher bearers when we need to be carried. Thanks be to God who helps those who work and pray. And even more, thanks be to God who helps those like you and like me who helps us when we can't help ourselves. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to be here today. We, God, we're so grateful for all the many saints that you've placed in our life who've had wisdom we don't have, knowledge we don't have. They've had gifts and strength that we don't have. And they've been able to help us in our time of need that they have been your face and they have been your hands. We're so thankful for those people. We're thankful for the ways that you are working through our lives. And God, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have to be able to be a blessing in the lives of others, to be able to carry those who are weak and who are hurting God, no matter what we face, no matter the circumstances, no matter whether we're in plenty or in want, we trust that you are with us. 
We trust that you are at work in and through us, through your church. But God, I must also confess that, at least speaking for myself alone today, that not always living up fully to who you have called me to be. But God, I want to be more like you. God, I want to see people come to you. I want to see people coming by the, by the thousands, the millions, turning their lives and their faith, completely trusting in you. So God, whatever it is, whatever we need to do, God, give us the wisdom and the guidance to be able to do that. Lead and direct us. If there's anyone here today that feels far from God, I pray that you would remind them of your love, that you would send people into their lives to remind them that they are loved, that they are your child, and there's nothing that you wouldn't do and nothing that you haven't done to help them even when they feel helpless. You're always there to pick them up. We thank you this morning for this time to be able to worship you, to come here in this place to gather together. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.